Good evening, welcome to Real Love Guitars, and um, this is going to be a reasonably short video. I just wanted to demonstrate the truss rod, or the, kind of more to the point, the strength of the truss rod. Um, one of the things that I've been very keen to try and um, impress on people is that regardless of whether you send or take your instrument to a luthier or a tech or whatever people like me are called, um, you need to, you should, you must, in all the nicest ways, you should be able to equip or, or prepare to um, make adjustments to your truss rod at any time in the year as is necessary. So um, immediately some people might think, well, I've just paid you loads of money to set my guitar up for me. Why should I need to make an adjustment after that? Um, that's kind of one instinctive feeling that some people have. And along with that goes, uh, it's sort of tied hand in hand or goes hand in hand with another feeling which is understandable um, that I think I probably had as well, but many people have. And that is a sort of sense of foreboding given to you by experts that you've read on forums in the past saying, oh, you don't want to be touching your truss rod because you'll damage your um, your neck on your guitar. And, and some people just say, oh, best left to an expert. And other people go even further and, and say things like, don't touch your truss rod, it will damage your guitar. You'll cause untold amount of damage and you'll never be able to fix it and you'll be sorry. Um, now that obviously sets people up to, I suppose, leave their guitar, guitars, guitars only in the hands of you know, paid experts, right? And I suppose that's a bit convenient, isn't it? You know, that people like me might spread that sort of information because then, you know, I might have the mindset that it guarantees me business because you'll be too afraid and I've set you up to be afraid and therefore you'll bring it to me. Um, well, that's crazy. You, my feeling is you bring a guitar to me, um, to have it fret leveled, to have the action set, and to have the uh, to have it set really low, and to have it set up so it stays plays and stays in tune. Um, but when you get it back from me, I would recommend that you need to be prepared to make small adjustments throughout the year because the setup I give you back um, may work for June this year, but in a couple of months' time, the humidity and temperature may change, and it may require some slight adjustment. Now, the first question is, why would you need to to adjust it? And the answer is that, first of all, ignore this saying reject. This is a reject. It's got a twist in it. It's a cheap Chinese neck that was working for a while and then dried out a bit and developed a twist. But trust rod, trust rod works on it. Um, yeah, so it's made of wood. And as you can see in the case of this one, uh, it continued to lose moisture over the year. And actually, this is quite a good example because um, given the I don't know how well we can see this, but given the grain in this one, which is not very good, it's covered in some stuff, but the grain sort of runs a bit like this. It's not brilliant end grain for a neck heel. It's not too bad. It's sort of vaguely in the same direction, but it does change a bit and it goes horizontal over here and is a bit diagonal here. So the, the sort of mismatch of the grain means that when this does dry which or expand or shrink, which it does all year long, um, if it's got a grain like that, it's liable to do something unusual like twist, and that's what this has done. So it's been rejected and it's come out, and I'm going to use it for this demonstration. But those sort of tiny changes are likely to happen all year round because the, the neck is made of wood, um, and because wood will expand and shrink depending on different um, conditions in the environment. So it's sort of important that you know how to make that adjustment to your truss rod because the thing that will change of it on its own the only the one thing that will change on its own throughout the year is the amount of humidity or the moisture in and the shape of the neck usually related to moisture it'd be the shape of the neck and you'll have you'll find it even hang on hanging on your wall or even in its case you may find that six months after i've set this up for you um you may find that you've taken out of the box and that you've got some buzzes the first thing you might know is you've got some buzz back which you didn't have before now, I'll, I'll know that that's because the neck has probably flattened out in a tiny amount um, more than it was when I had it. Um, but because the tolerances are so low, in because you had a probably asked me to set you a very low action, um, that means the tolerances, the clearances, if you like, are so low 
that even the slightest bit of bending uh, in the neck can result in that setup suddenly feeling like it, or suddenly picking up some buzzes at different places. So I suppose the thing to say overall is that the, the lower you have your action naturally, the more susceptible you are to the effects of these slight changes, which are happening all the time. Um, if you've got a very high action, it follows that you probably won't notice the tiny changes in the neck because your action is high enough to kind of cover it over, if you like, or, or to obscure it or mask it. Um, if it's very, very low, you'll immediately feel it because we are dealing with such small clearances anyway. So that's why it's critical for you, especially if you've had a low setup, a low action setup done. Um, it's really important for you to know how to make adjustments to this thing. Now, I, I guess I'll cover the basics of it because I can't really criticize other people setting you up to be afraid of it and, and then not clarify anything. Um, I would say, certainly in my experience, I suppose I'll, I'd, I'd be better off pointing this here camera for a minute at a whiteboard so I can just cover these issues. In fact, I can zoom out a bit, get a wider view. Um, so the, the idea of the truss rod is, is very simple. In the olden days, um, guitars just had necks and then when you loaded the necks with strings, um, the necks bent like that because the strings were um, running from end to end, not very good drawing, and they were basically trying to pull this end in towards that end. And then that, the result of that was a, a curvature of the neck. Um, in old guitars like arch tops and things like that, which didn't, some of which didn't have truss rods at all, um, the neck would inevitably bend over, the, over time um, and it would stay in a permanent bend and it would bend more and more over time and eventually become unplayable. Um, and partly because you can see that the action in the middle becomes mostly unplayable. It tends to reduce a little bit at either end, obviously, um, but ultimately it becomes an unplayable thing. So, so the first thing to remember is that the strings always pull. They put a load on the neck from end to end and they pull it uh, in such a way that it curves, it bends, its natural tendency is to bend. Don't forget that the strings also compress not only do they bend the neck in this direction, the wood, but they also try to compress it in this direction. Um, that's a separate story for another time. But that that little that what I call longitudinal compression is important um, in relation to fret leveling, but it's not something to cover right now. So um, that's your that's your strings bending a wooden neck. So what they did in the at some point in history is they took the neck and um, I'm changing colours. I don't know why. Um, and it got loaded with strings, as we've seen. How many colours? They're all changing colours. No, no, no good. There's our strings bending the neck. Um, and then what they did was they put in a truss rod into the wood of the neck. And the truss rod was... I thought I was using black. That's because I got the wrong colour on the wrong thing. I've got all the wrong lids on things. What on earth is going on? That's purple. That's red. And I appear to have, I've got two reds and no blacks. What, what am I doing? Anybody can help me? I seem to have lost all my blacks. No, that's red, that's black. That's miraculous. I, I actually managed to lose, no, there's the black. Right, <laughs> I, thought, I really thought I'd gone nuts. Okay, yeah, so in, at some point they started reinforcing the neck with steel. So you put in a steel bar like that and it would help to um, stop the neck bending. But a bar on its own really is a bit uncontrollable. If you get it about the right width and thickness, you might find that um, everything works just great. In fact, if it's a really strong bar, then your neck ends up being like that, right? That's the surface of your neck. Now you don't really want that because the whole purpose of the, the neck is to have a little bit of space in the middle, in the center of the neck between the strings and the and the neck. And the reason for that is, is when you spin your strings, when you hit them, they kind of spin like a skipping rope thing. Kiddies playing a skipping rope, remember that? That's a jump rope, and it spins more in the middle of its uh, of its range than it does at the corner at the edges, right? So really, if you're thinking about it, your neck needs a little bit of curvature to accommodate those that. Um, spin so let's go back to the black it's a bit of better color so here's your 
neck, right? Exaggerated, right? And you've got some bend in it. Very good. That's great. And, it, and you can see it, um, the, the notional point of the strings is at rest. They kind of go through there a bit like that, but there's enough room to allow them to spin like that, okay? So the question is, so the first rule of the truss rod or your neck is you need a bit of curvature in it, just enough to allow the strings to spin. How big, the, how far they spin depends on how hard you hit them, the scale length of the neck and the gauge of the string. So there's a few different variables at play, but the truth is they will move and they will describe a certain space in this direction that you need to accommodate. Um, the problem is with a piece of wood, the neck, you can't, you can't guarantee where that ends up. You don't want, you don't want it you know, too much because you'll have too much room and the action will feel terrible. You don't want it flat because the spinning strings will hit the strings, um, hit the frets most of the time. So you need this just enough, right? And this just enough is, is impossible in, uh, to arrive at uh, unless you've got some way of kind of adjusting and dialing it back because you know that in terms of variables, the string loading Right, we'll put one set of loads on this thing and it'll bend it a certain amount, um, which creates an automatic curve, but it's not controlled. It's just however much the strings load your particular wooden neck, right? Depending on the thickness of the neck, the type of wood and so on. Uh, then you also know there's how hard you hit it. That's going to require you to bend it a bit more, or a bit less. So this, hoping that you've got enough bend on your neck for the strings you're using and the way you play is just it's just potluck you can't you can't rely on that hence they invented the adjustable truss rod so in that case you have your um let's do it you have your uh your neck with a certain amount of bend which as we know is dialed in such a way as to accommodate the full range of string movement that's great and you know that you, how do you achieve it? Well, you achieve it by this device inside your neck called a truss rod. And the truss rod can go in most guitars or in, in older style guitars like this, will go from uh, loose equals uh, no impact on the neck effectively. So it's not really doing anything to tightened Right, which equals countering the string, I suppose we could call it string pulled curvature. So the idea of that kind of truss rod, as you find in a guitar like this, in a neck like this, is you, you um, put the strings on, tighten them up, and the neck is kind of designed thin enough to bend a little bit. And if it's too much, you tighten the truss rod, which the job of which then is it bends in the opposite direction to the curve and it flattens the string pulled curve out a little bit. And so using tightening actions on the truss rod here via its adjuster in there with a hex key, um, you will make tightening adjustments until you have tamed the string pulled curvature to just what you need for the amount of um, movement your strings make and the that's also another variables in there of course is the height of your action at either end so there's quite a lot of variables but ultimately there is a certain amount of movement that your strings will need and combined with the height of your actions at either end you will there'll be an optimum setting of curvature to give you that room so you can play and it won't um, clatter against the frets the strings won't clatter against the frets that's a simple truss rod, effectively. Um, the, the simplest of all is the bar, steel reinforced neck. You might see some from old Japanese Japanese um, guitars, but uh, they're, they're, they're very, they're a bit hit or miss. Um, in fact, you can have the, the bar sometimes can be so strong that the strings don't bend it, uh, and therefore it's, you're stuck with a flat neck and you can't really play it. Um, if, you, if, you, uh, if you have this kind of neck, simple strat neck, um, inexpensive strat neck you'll have a now this is where this is where it goes wrong forget the names because the names get completely confusing people misuse two-way truss rod truss rod dual action truss rod there's all kinds of confusions over this let's not even bother what they're called let's call this the truss rod that works in positively in one direction there you go off things we take and i'll show you one of those right now ignore the fact this has got a bit of um tape um sandpaper on the bottom this is what I mean by a 
um, one direction positive uh, truss rod. And it, it looks, you'll see it, it's very standard looking. It means that uh, if you undo it, if I find a key, if you undo this truss rod, slacken it off, um, and let's say you, your guitar needed, you found that uh, it was um, too flat and you wanted to let the strings pull more curvature in it, what you'd need to do is to try and slacken this off um, to allow this rod to flatten and allow the strings to pull more curve. Problem is, of course, is if you slacken this right off to the point where it's loose like this, and there still isn't enough curve pulled in your neck, then it, it doesn't matter if you keep turning this counterclockwise. Um, all that will happen, as you saw, is the adjuster end will fall off. It can, it's okay, you can put it back on again, right? It's easier to do just by hand. Um, but until this bites and starts going in the other direction, it doesn't really do anything. It'll, it'll either go back to flat and then the adjuster will drop off since there's no positive adjustment in the counterclockwise, or uh, you go the other way in the clockwise, in which case you put it on until it bites, and then when you turn it, um, I don't know if I can do it, I'll show you down long view. Let's give you a long view if I can. You can probably see, see how that's curving already visibly, right? That's, that's the truss rod adjusted with force, and I can't really do much because I can't hold it very well. Normally it's locked into the neck. But that's, um, that's showing it positively curving in the tightening department. And you would do that to counteract the bend of the bend in the neck caused by the strings. So that's a one direction, a one direction positive truss rod. Um, now, in a case of a guitar like this, oh, where's it gone? In this sort of neck, that's what you'll find. In modern guitar necks, you'll very often find a two direction positive where uh, Unlike the one I just showed you, this thing will go, will, will adjust positively in the clockwise, um, which will cause the neck to flatten and then go into a positive curve or a back bow. Right, that's the that's turning positively in the clockwise. If you undo it, it'll come back to a loose or a midpoint where the neck will be effectively flat or whatever the string pull does to it. And then when you go past that center point it'll start tightening again in the counterclockwise direction, and that will pull a curvature into the neck, um, whatever the string, regardless of what the strings are doing. So that is positive in both directions. And the good thing about that is have, if you've got a neck uh, where the string loading is not enough to overcome the stiffness of the neck, then on its own, the strings can't pull the required curvature into the neck. But a positive in both directions truss rod um, uh, allows you to do that because you can manually bend the rod in the opposite direction in a positive sense and it will create the curvature you need whereas the simple format simple form can't do that it just tightens or comes to uh, slack and then undoes all right so that's an interesting difference um, you could probably find out better for yourself what that kind of positive in two directions truss rod is called but um, like I said, if, if you go to, a, I've had the experience of going to a shop or speaking to someone or ordering online, I go, I want a dual action truss rod. And they go, oh yes, this is a dual action truss rod um, because it's got a rod and a bar, right? That's just a truss rod with two components that does one thing really. It tightens up or it undoes. That's all it does. It tightens up one direction. Um, you might ask them for a dual action or a two way truss rod and they might give you one, if you're lucky, that goes in both directions. But you have to figure out what it's called in your part of the world. But the thing to know is that there is one that works positively in one direction, and that's only in the clockwise. Um, if you do it the other way, it's only ever slacking it. If you do the other one, it it eventually, go in one direction, it it uh, bends the neck, uh, bends the truss rod positively in the doing up, the clockwise direction, and that causes it to... Um, go into eventually go into a back bow or a positive hump um, and in the other direction you go past the center point uh, where it should be flattish and then it goes positively in the counterclockwise direction and then you get positive curvature or relief so anyway that's the thing so that's the important bit about what the two types of uh, or three I suppose the the 
simple bar, metal reinforced, steel reinforced rod that has no adjustment. Uh, the one positive direction adjustment, type, this type of one, uh, or the positive in two directions type, which, which is more effective and you prefer if you can have it working on your neck. That's the three kinds. And, and the reason why you have a truss rod is to control the amount of curvature in your neck so you can set it at the optimum, taking into account all the other variables and the way you play and the string loading and uh, sorry, in the string gauge and the, the scale length and so on. All those variables combine to require a certain amount of curvature. And the truss rod is supposed to be the device that allows you to set that just right for your style and the setup or the configuration of things, the collection of variables you've got. That's the important bit. So let me just write that down because I want to, I didn't mean this to be a sort of lecture on the whole thing of truss rods exactly, but it's better to point it out. So the primary purpose, right? And this is important to remember. Primary purpose, focus boy, is, as I said, to control the curvature of your neck. Your neck. Taking into account I'm putting TIA, I've never seen that abbreviation, but that's what it means here. Taking into account all the variables involved. And we know those equal neck composition, string gauge, whoops, gauge, um, action at both ends, scale length, Shorter guitars um, have floppier strings for the same pitch, um, for the same gauge as well. Scale length, um, strength of strength of um, play, playing. You know how hard you hit it, etc. And there's probably a few more even if I haven't thought of. But so the primary purpose of the truss rod is only nothing else but to control the curvature of the neck. Right, taking into account all those variables to give you ultimately uh, the correct amount of curvature for your style and all your settings there. Right, the right amount of curvature so that you can play without your strings slapping against the frets. Ta -da! And the important thing, right, that's the primary purpose right so you've you've gone to forums and you've heard people say oh yeah I, I i got this out of the box and i played it and it was the action was a bit high so i adjusted the truss rod and now it's brilliant so i set the action and it's brilliant right that's not there that's not what the truss rod is for the important thing to say is if we get make a distinction and i want it's important to remember this distinction because you'll know something that a lot of people don't seem to know there is a secondary effect of adjusting your truss rod right and you've seen it already in this little talk all right and we'll draw it right there you are you've adjusted it to just what you like right and there's your strings okay what's the secondary effect that it appears to increase the playing action in the middle of the neck or roughly in the middle of the neck okay so it has a secondary effect of increasing or decreasing decreasing string height, I suppose you could call it, rather than playing action, let's call it string height, um, um, more in middle than the ends, naturally, because it's a curve, all right? You can see that, it's quite clear. More there than there, right? So if you dial in more curvature into your neck with the truss rod, it, um, or if you do adjust your truss rod and yeah, create more curvature. Secondary effect is that you will increase the playing, the perceived playing action or the actual playing action in the middle. And, and that's quite a big touchy-feely thing. You'll really notice that, right? But the reason I make the distinction between primary and secondary is that you don't... My advice is when you get a guitar and you find that the action is high, um, hard to play and it's high, you don't go primarily to your truss rod to adjust it. You go, first of all, to setting your your um, nut 
height, your first fret action, and your last fret or your bridge action, right? That's the primary pl places you set your playing action. Of course, then using your truss rod to get the correct amount of relief for that playing action and the other factors involved, as we just saw, seen, um, that then has an impact on your your um, the, the felt playing action. Um, and of course, they're inter interrelated, right? So um, you might find yourself saying, well, OK, I've got a nice low action at both ends here, but because I hit it really, really hard and I've got very floppy strings on a short scale guitar, I've got to increase the relief to stop the string slapping against the frets and you go well having despite having set a low action it still feels quite high in the middle right so yes there is an action implication but as i said it's a secondary consequence of doing what this is the truss rod is supposed to do which is creating the right amount of curvature first and foremost for your strings and your playing style on that guitar so the reason i wanted to make that distinction is i don't don't fool yourself or don't make the mistake of going after the truss rod as if it's primary role is to control your action it's not its primary role is to set the right amount of clearance to allow your strings to spin a secondary byproduct of that is that will increase or decrease the string height primarily in the middle of the neck which will then give the guitar more or less feeling of um, high action um, on top of what you've already set at the ends now of course uh, you, the three things i'll show them here the nut action, number one, the last fret or bridge action, number two, and the neck relief as shown by the curvature set here. Those three things are interrelated. If you've got, um, if you if you absolutely are wedded to your the way that your neck is curved or relieved and you don't want to adjust it any higher, but you're getting what I call um, uh, fret slap, where the strings are spinning and hitting the frets, okay, as we described before, then, and you say, well, like, I don't want to adjust that. I totally love the way this neck profile feels. Then your option is either to hit it less hard or to raise the action at either, probably, you know, more, more likely the bridge end, but if necessary, at both ends a little bit, um, which I, with an adjustable nut, I can do. But um, because they're interrelated, you can solve the problem by raising that, which gives more space for the strings. And therefore you haven't changed the shape of the neck, but you've cleared a little more space that way there is an extra way i do it and that's with my fret leveling technique is i actually without changing any of those things once i've set those three things there um, i can actually eke out a little bit more space when i come to fret level because the beauty of this particular tool that i use um actually more likely the beauty of the other one that i won't show you now the u channel one is that it keeps its shape really well as a curve and it actually if you if you remember me saying that um when you when a, a neck is um, compressed longitudinally, uh, let's draw this again. You've seen this on a few other videos, but uh, when you when you put some strings on a guitar, they're under let's say two hundred pounds constant loading. That's going to bend your neck, but because it's pulling in this um, what I call longitudinal compression, so it's squeezing the neck as well as trying to bend it. Um, what you get is in fact a neck that sort of does that or a, yeah it's more like that than it is like a curve and that's amazing because you can't really see it but um the tool i use for fret leveling does actually show that up um now normally that's okay and you still this, the same thing still apply you've got that slightly wobbly neck you you set your actions one two and three right and then you sort of get it to a place where by and large nothing hits the frets and it sounds good however my fret leveling technique, because it it kind of samples the curve and makes an ideal curve as a leveling beam. You can see how nice and smooth that is by comparison to the actual. And what it does is it kind of imposes itself on the unevenness while the guitar is strung. And it just clips off the offending um, hills, if you like, a little bit. And you get a tiny bit more clearance out in the critical um, area where the strings spin most in fact it's critical at all lengths but it seems to impact quite a lot in the middle um, but that fret leveling technique creates a little bit more room so it's an, it's an additional intervention that really helps this business of creating the clearance without over relieving the neck or raising the action higher so that's one little intervention i can make with my 
technique. And that's, by the way, a secondary consequence of my fret leveling technique. The primary consequence or the primary effect of it is to level individual high or low frets. A secondary benefit uh, is to um, impose a slightly idealized curve on the otherwise wibbly, wobbly, um, real life compressed fretboard. Wow, there you go. So that's the that's the old talk through, and and I hope that um, helped sort of clear up. So when you when you hear people say, you know, you you now be able to spot when people are, are misinformed, and and it's not for the spotting for the sake of being yeah yeah clever. You're an a hole, and I'm so clever. It's just great to know when people have been misled along the way, and they're following a dogma that you know perhaps a bit better about due to experience and having thought it through, which is kind of how I come to whatever I understand about anything. Um, and, and it's not helped, as I said at the beginning, by people who seem to have a vested interest, or maybe they're just not very good at challenging dogma, and they, they repeat, they accept and repeat the same dogmatic statements, okay? Um, this isn't exactly a short video. So, you know, this isn't helped by people who tell you, you know, stuff about, well, the the, re the way you adjust your uh, action is to get your truss rod on. Or uh, you can't adjust your truss rod because uh, it'll ruin your guitar, right? I'll give you an example. So this is, this truss rod in this neck, right? The first thing is the neck is twisted, but that's, it's still a neck and it still works, but it's not, it's taken off a guitar. It's going to be binned eventually. But I wanted to demonstrate, um, this you saw when I bent the uh, twisted the let's go back to the um the truss rod in a minute so this truss rod in this guitar is in this neck below here is pretty much identical to this so what have we got and it maybe this is still worth pointing out we have got a first of all a rod okay with a threaded bit on the end um, and, a, and a bit that moves along and a, an adjustable bit and then there's an adjuster that you can screw in to push um, this part of the thing that way when you screw it um, and welded to one end here down here welded directly to the bar sorry the rod is a, is a bar so it's a flat shaped bar of steel okay um, and they're separate and you can't really see it but if I pull them apart you can see it right uh, and then at this end the bar is welded to the adjuster, which currently is sitting at the same length, or it all looks the same length, so nothing's happening, and the bar kind of sits flat on the rod. Um, but because I can use a truss rod, a uh, hex key, as you've seen, to push, turn this, and as I tighten it, this piece goes that way, and it pushes this movable piece that way too. Now, the interesting thing is, this is allowed to move along the, the rod, but the problem is it's attached to this bar and the bar can't compress. So the bar does the only thing the bar can do as that as this end moves inwards. The only thing this bar can do is to bend outwards, can't shrink or can't you know literally compress. So it bends outwards and that's how you get the curving effect on the truss rod. So you can start to imagine that there's no there's no sort of pixie magic going on underneath your piece of wood. You have got a truss rod, which is pretty much like this. Even if it works in the other direction, it's pretty much, um, it's pretty much like this. It's, it's pieces of metal and screw threads um, and little bits of welded or soldered or whatever. Welded, I'd say, joins. So it's not rocket science. And so you think to yourself, well, how can I break this? Well, you can see straight away that if I turn this We've already seen it, but I turn this one way. All I get is the hex adjuster with a thread inside there comes off. You'll notice there's a couple of washers on here. I added those to give this a bit more push because I, when I started using it, it felt like it it worn out. So I added a couple of washers, which give me more to push against um, for the same amount of thread. It seemed to help. Anyway, so I do it up again. I get to this point, and as you've seen before, let's get a let's get a pair of pliers. I can just hold on to this. Let's see just how we'll do the test partly here. So this is my truss rod for leveling and I don't mind putting it under load. Let's see if I can let's see if I can get it grip on it. Okay. So there I am gripping it with some thingamajigs. And look, I'm gonna now really tighten the thing. Wow. Now oh, look at the gap. Look at that. All right, have I broken it? No. So what's happening? Is it is the metal, is the weld likely to snap off? 
Well, possibly, but I doubt it. Um, you know, tighten it up. It'll just keep us, it, it'll expand or push, sorry, expand. It'll push, cause the um, bar to bend outwards away from the rod as much as it can do until I run out of thread down there, okay? Now, while it's inside the neck, it'll be trying to push the wood of the neck as well. So let me just undo this back again. So that was, as you can see, that was pretty radical, right? Now we're at loose and it's flattened out again. So let's go now to the real neck. Okay, and my job now is I'm gonna break this neck, right? So remember all the advice about don't touch your truss rod because you can ruin it, right? So this is, I'm gonna connect it. They're a little bit harder now because we've got this slightly difficult to get access to hole, but I'm just tightening this one now from slack to a bit tighter and I can feel it starting to just bite. But then at this point, it starts to get hard to remove the tool. So I'm sorry if it's not looking very delicate. There we go, we've got a bite there right now. Here we go, look. I can hear the wood creaking a little bit. Um, now, by the way, this, this neck has shrunk a little bit and there's a discontinuity between the fingerboard. I can feel it and the rosewood. So the maple has shrunk under the rosewood because and that's what caused this whole thing to twist, by the way. Um, but if anything was going to break, well, maybe this would separate the fingerboard since it's already shrinking at two different rates. So maybe it would bust the... On, the, on this guitar more than any other on this neck, surely it will just bust off the, um, the fingerboard because it's, it's shrinking at different rates. Ugh. So there we go, straight away. Let's have a hold this up and now let's have a look. Ooh, yeah, can you see the amount of curvature on that? Sorry, it's not the greatest shot in the world. See how much curvature we've got in there? A ton, right? Is it broken yet? No, nope, nothing snapped. The frets jumped out into the sky and pinged all over the room. No, let's keep going. <coughs> More tightening. Yeah, it's, it's as back bowed as, I mean, you put it down here now, you could sort of, <laughs> you know, do that. Anyway, uh, keep going. Let's see if we can break it. Oh, uh, what I'm more likely to do is that, which is scuff the... Uh, hex adjuster and if I do that too many times I won't ever get a bite on it again right you can hear I'm I'm putting some force into this now let's have a look again at the curvature now I mean that's mad right you will never go anywhere you'll never want to go anywhere near this sort of curvature for any well look at it I mean how that that's that's massively back bowed you you your guitar wouldn't play at all you'd never go anywhere near that so it's got its own self What's the word? Um, Self-contained logic. There's no, there's no kind of application of a curve that you would do to that extreme. Um, you can see the twist on it, but you'd never, you'd never even start going there. So you'd never even get to putting this under as much force as I've just done. But have you noticed? Has it broken? Nope, not at all. So I just hope that gives you some confidence, right? If it's this kind of truss rod, if you go too much counterclockwise all that will happen is this will drop off in your hand. If you go too much in the other direction, you'll get a banana of a neck like I've got here and nothing bad will happen to the neck. Look at this. Now, I have to say, because it's under tension, if I drop this on the floor now, it could be that the tension will shed itself, or the stress will shed itself by separating the, um, the, the fingerboard and the maple because the truss rod sits underneath the fingerboard and is pressing against the fingerboard and the maple, right? So it's making, it's clearly pushing against the two bits of wood. So that's why I said to you that it may be a risk of it splitting if there's weakness in there, well, maybe it will split the, uh, you can even see it down there probably. I can't see because it's, there you go, look at that. So, you know, if there's anywhere it's gonna damage your guitar at all, it might be in forcing, a, you know, exploiting a weakness between in the joint there, but look, not at all. But like I said, if I dropped it from a height onto a floor, uh, chances are that the forces would release by separating the fingerboard. I've had that happen to me in the past, and that was, but that was on a guitar where the neck wasn't even curved. It just, it just said, right, forces, shed them. Easiest thing to do is break apart the 
the glue seal and it did that and I put it back on, glued it back on, played the guitar and it was lovely. But there you go. So that's massively back bowed. Um, I've swung on it. I'm gonna push it to the last bit. But I can't even turn it anymore. <coughs> you can see that, sorry. You have to take my word for it. Okay, now look how, look how bent that is. I mean, that's just loony and it really is. Um, it's slightly ha hampered by the, um, by the uh, twist, but it's got a fabulous sort of back forward bow. Anyway, so I can't break it. And you would have to go some length. <coughs> Let's try and bring it back now. You'd have to go some length. And like I said, this is the second time I've done this experiment. The first time was with a neck that had a seized truss rod. For whatever reason, it may have rusted up inside and it wouldn't turn. Um, and I swung on that until the hex key literally bent. And I put a, a spanner on it and I put a, a screwdriver in the spanner to add leverage. And the hex key bent like it was going to splinter and nothing happened to the truss rod. It didn't shear it, it didn't undo it, and nothing. And so there we are. We're back to loose and we're back to straight relatively straight neck again flat neck okay so that was my little run through again I, I very I'm, I'm doing this not to kind of go on about assume that you don't know about trust rods I'm going on about it because I want you I want everybody to understand that when you know when you've paid good money to me to set your guitar up and you get it back you it's in your interest and mine for you to be able to feel confident making these tiny adjustments, okay? And and I've shown you, you can't damage it, right? That's the first thing. And what I also want to um, convince you of is the fact that um, you also can't go wrong. If you do a little tweak to something, so for example, very simply, if you get a guitar back from me with a very low action and then three months later, as the season changes, you find it starts to make more buzzing than it did. Well, I'll tell you what, the frets aren't getting higher. They aren't jumping out more than they were. What's happened is that your neck shape will have changed a little bit. Um, if, and more than likely, it's, it's buzzing more because it's gone a little bit flatter. If it went a little bit more curved, um, it's likely you wouldn't notice. Right? It, would, it would play perfectly well. So it's almost certainly the fact that it's flattened out a little uh, over the time. And it only needs to flatten by a minuscule fraction of a millimeter to return to some buzzing in which case the simple logic of this is or the, the logic of this is very very simple if that happens you need to be confident to get your truss rod adjuster and if the neck is too flat then what you want to do is you want to loosen it slightly counterclockwise um, loosening the truss rod counterclockwise will allow will, will relax the um, truss rod inside and it will allow the strings to do pull more of the curvature so that's your best bet is a tiny mo movement in the counterclockwise and you don't need to do it at all much do it whatever you're comfortable with you know five degrees on the circle if you like and have a play 15 degree or, or in this case 40 degrees 45 degrees have a play too much go back half of that distance again you can't go wrong you can keep doing it until it's where you like it. That's the most important thing. And you can see that genuinely, you, any adjustment, this is the important thing to say, any adjustment you're gonna need to do to make those tiny changes to correct the seasonal adjustments or the seasonal changes the weather brings, right, is never going to be much more than within, at most, 180 degrees, a flat turn either way, right? That is the absolute most you will ever need to do. It's probably more realistically gonna be within five, 10 degrees of movement, right? There's enough to, to regain the little bit of clearance you need. So you you don't need to be worried about doing that compared to the several times round, maybe, I don't know, 360 times, whatever it is too, that I did on this um, without breaking it. See what I mean? You're, you're nowhere near going anywhere near that. So do not feel afraid to adjust. And all that, all you have to remember is that all that happens is you're changing the amount of curvature in the neck. And that's all you're doing. You're, there are secondary effects, which is if you change it a lot, the action may feel higher or lower, mostly around the middle because of the reasons we saw. But the primary effect of adjusting the truss rod is to increase or decrease the curvature on your neck. And that's something you genuinely need to be comfortable doing for your own sake, so that you can counter those seasonal minuscule changes without 
worrying or coming back to me and feeling like you need to pay me to make that tiny adjustment. It's, it's, it should be the you that's comfortable doing that all year round because your environment changes differently from how mine does. So there's no point in me setting it for my environment. Um, so I hope that was useful. That was just me um, covering all that again. Mainly, I want to be able to, um, I want to be able to uh, link people to this video once I've sent a guitar, even if nothing changes. I still want people, I still want you to be armed with this explanation so you feel confident and you also understand why it's good for you to do it um, and not to be afraid of doing it, but good for you to do it so that you, um, it's the right thing to do is to constantly be able to adjust your uh, instrument and never more so than if you've got a very low action. If you choose a very low action, you are going to be much more susceptible to the tiny fluctuations of the curvature throughout the year. And that's why the lower you go as a playing action, the more comfortable you need to be with this so that you don't waste your money coming back to me, um, having making a tiny amendment that you can do very comfortably and very confidently on your own. Okay, hope that was useful. I go on, but you know, that's my style. So thanks for watching. And um, if you've bought a really lovely guitar, I hope this helps you um, de-stress you if you need to make that tiny adjustment. Um, of course, I'm always here to talk you through it or explain anything that didn't make sense. And, and if you bought a guitar from me, oh, well, I explain to everyone, even people who aren't customers. But if certainly if you bought one from me and you're worried about it, I can talk you through it anytime. So, all right, no stress.